and, uh, and those who haven't come for a while with the lockdown, I declare freedom. Amen. 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 No spirit of lockdown, you're all free in Jesus' name. And that's a powerful thing. I was, you were texting while he was, you were stuck in the hotel room. You know, hotel room is only enjoyable when you're there for the time you want to be there. And like, can you imagine two weeks stuck in a room, you can't even open the windows. And you can't even get out. The food is brought to you, and you just open the door, take your food in, and leave the dishes out again. So it was really like a, a prison. And uh, two weeks of hotel aircon air, wow. Amazing how you survive without fresh air for those two weeks. But God is good. And so let's be thankful for His goodness this morning, all that He's given us. Amen. Well, as I shared um, today, Friday evening to Sunday evening, which is today, is Jewish New Year's Day. And why they believe it is the New Year is the, the anniversary of the creation of the heavens and the earth. Because uh, in Hebrew, the name for this month, which is the seventh month in their calendar, is Tishrei, T-I-S-H-R-E-I. And so today is, I believe, the first of Tishrei. And they believe that this is the anniversary of the creation because when you read in Hebrew in the beginning, in Genesis 1-1, you read it backwards, it's the first of Tishrei. Isn't that interesting? In Hebrew, in the beginning, backwards, is the first of this month. So they believe that God started to create on this day 6,000 or how many years ago. And not only that, this is, the, this is called the Feast of Trumpets because they believe on this day, you will hear the trumpet call one year whenever it is, but on between this weekend, Friday to Sunday, whichever year it is, the Lord will return. But let's let's um, prepare our hearts for the Word of God. And I know that we have a big temptation here. It's a beautiful view. <laughs> right? So don't let the enemy steal his word. But um, I believe God wants to do something new in our lives, in this church. And um, so let's, let's open in prayer. Father, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for each one here, Lord. We thank you for your calling upon their lives. We thank you, the Lord, that you awaken their ears and their hearts to see your plan and purpose for them, Lord. Even in what they're doing, Lord, that they are, at the end of the day, ministers for you. Sons and daughters of you, Lord, in their place of their influence, in their office, in their homes, in their friends, colleagues, relatives, Lord. You may your word this morning go forth and not return to you empty, but accomplish what you please and prosper the reason for which you sent it. Thank you, Lord, for giving us ears to hear your voice, for transforming us through the power of your word, Lord, renewing our minds to the mind of Christ the Son, that the hearts will be transformed, and that we would increase in the awareness of your presence, of your peace, of your joy, of your power, that you are greater than any giant. You are greater than any valley. And we thank you, Lord, for the new thing, even as this is a new beginning in your calendar, Lord. We declare a new beginning for each one of us in this house, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right, to give you a, a little, a little um, introduction, you know, the, all the major events to believers, such as Good Friday, Easter Sunday, or Better Soul Resurrection Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, all these events began on a specific <laughs> date in God's calendar. Because before, why we celebrate Passover? Well, we, we, we remember Jesus. That was the night that Jesus was betrayed. Um, and uh, the Sunday was when he was in the, in the tomb, in the buried. And Sunday was Resurrection Sunday. Now, before Jesus was born, on those very dates, those exact dates, hundreds of years earlier, if not more, the Jews would celebrate the Bali harvest. The barley harvest. So you find that, that not only was the... So every year on that day, the Jews would come together and celebrate the harvest. And um, and on Passover, they would remember, not only would they celebrate the harvest, but they would remember the deliverance from Egypt. So the day, the night that God delivered His people out of Egypt was the Passover night. And, uh, and they had to get out quickly. And the crossing the Red Sea was the Saturday. It was it speaks of our baptism. So it is his death on Friday night, it speaks of our salvation. Then we walk through, we get out of the world to baptism, and on Sunday we celebrate resurrection Sunday. So it was a, a harvest season of Bali. Now on Pentecost was the early rain. And it was the wheat season. They would harvest the wheat. 
And that was the day, the exact day that God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. Can you imagine that? So every year they would celebrate, when the commandments were given, the Ten Commandments were given to Moses, they would celebrate the wheat harvest, they would celebrate the, the early rains. And so when Jesus told his disciples to wait till they received the Holy Spirit, guess when the Holy Spirit fell? Guess when Pentecost Sunday is? Pentecost Sunday is the exact day that God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. You see, he does nothing without a time, in the fullness of time. And many times in scripture you find in due season, at the appointed time, in the fullness of time. So through Christ, what has been fulfilled? Our salvation through the Passover, that's the first major festival. The second major festival is Pentecost, fulfilled through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Guess what is said to be fulfilled? This season. So this time of the year, we don't know what year, but on whatever year it happens, on this season, you will hear the trumpet sound. That's why it's called the festival of the Feast of Trumpets. So before we come to the season, there's a long period from Pentecost, from Pentecost about 50 days from the resurrection of Christ. Right, 10 days after he ascended up. And it's a long period from then to this time of the year. So the, what does the Bible say? At the end of the age is the harvest. So this season is the greater harvest, the greater rain. You know, we hear the former rain and the latter rain. The former rain was Pentecost, this is the latter rain. The early harvest, the small harvest, the first fruits was Pentecost. You know, when Moses got the commandments, 3,000 died because they made the golden calf. But on Pentecost day, 3,000 were added to the Lord, to grace and truth. And so now on this season, it's going to be the day that the Lord returns. The anniversary of when he, he in the beginning, you're going to hear the trumpet and you're going to take him. His people are going to go up together, the rapture, the second coming, around this time. I think 15 days from now is the Feast of Tabernacles. So what is all this about? I'm just going to focus on one aspect. If you can turn with me to Numbers chapter 10. The emphasis of this festival is becoming one. The Lord gathers His people together. Before the trumpet sounds and the church is taken up together and the, and the wheat is separated from the tares, God is going to make His church one so that the harvest can come in. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Before the 3,000 were added, the 120 became one. And so Numbers uh, chapter 10, the verse is the verse, the first three verses. What happened on the on this festival? It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the assembly and for directing the movement of the camps. Verse 3, when they blow both of them, the trumpets, all the assembly shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You're going to stop there. When the trumpet is sounds, the assembly shall come together before Moses at the door of the tabernacle. Now this verse 3 is full of prophecy, very prophetic. What's the prophecy? Who's the door? Jesus. John 10 says, Jesus says, I am the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. What does the tabernacle represent? The presence of God. Until this trumpet was sounded, the 12 tribes were divided into north, south, east, and west. Three tribes in the north, three tribes in the east, three tribes in the south, three tribes in the west. But when they heard the trumpet, all these tribes, the 12 tribes, would come together. Before the, uh, the tabernacle of Moses, before his presence, before the door. So this speaks of the time when Jesus, who is the door, is going to bring his people together to his presence to make them one. So all the 12 tribes are different. They're 12 different tribes, but they became one through Christ at his presence. And so my message this morning is together and one. Together and one. In fact, I'm very seriously thinking about making this the title of my next book. Together and one. The John 10 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. Together and one. What does this mean? Many, how, when do we come together? We come together at salvation. The ecclesia, the call up body of Christ. But the biggest problem in the body of Christ is we are together but we are not one. You see, togetherness speaks of being in the same place. In the same house, in the same church, in the same ministry. But unfortunately, everybody who's together is not united. It's not one in relationship. And where did this problem begin? Not on earth, in heaven. 
Before the fall of Lucifer, all of heaven were together in heaven. But there were not one. There was one black sheep or black goat, Lucifer. Though he was together, he was not one with the Father or with Michael and Gabriel and the two thirds. He was one with the one third that did influence. So they were together, but not one. Though externally, the environment, the environment, the environment perfect leadership, perfect father, the best presence, all the glory, everything in a perfect theology. Lucifer was the best theologian. He knew Hebrew, Greek, he knew all the languages. He had better quali qualifications than all the best seminaries. And yet, he's now the father of lies. What's the point? Before his fall, they were together but not one. Remember the house of the prodigal son. Together, elder brother, younger brother, before the prodigal left home, they were together with the father, but they were not one. And when the prodigal left home and he came back, the son became one with the father. But because the elder brother was not one with the father, the two brothers could not be one. They were together in the house, but not one. And so we see the same problem even in, in families. In families, there are many families with many children, especially grown-up adult children, who are in the same family, maybe even as teenagers or younger, they may be together in the house, but not one with father and mother. In fact, there are many couples who are married, but only on paper. Relationally, they are not one. And so what is in the house is in the church. There are many churches where they come together under one roof every Sunday, but they are not one relationally. And it's just a matter of time, if they do not become one, that the enemy uses a lack of oneness to cause division. You see, we do not know how long Lucifer was leading worship until the split happened. For eternity, who knows, there's no time there. And suddenly, because he was not one, the division happened. And we don't know how long the elder brother and prodigal were serving together. They were together for a long time and suddenly, there was a split. The prodigal took off. Thank God he came to his senses, came back, became one with the father. But until the elder brother would become one with the father, it could not be one. And so we do not know when something bad may happen in any church or ministry until and unless they become one. And so a lack of oneness is the greatest reason why division happens in the body of Christ. You see, it is not enough to come together through salvation. The, the, the millions that came out of Egypt were together, but they were not one. In fact, of the 12 elders of the 12 tribes that fight the promised land, only two are one, Joshua and Caleb. But because the majority were not one with Joshua and Caleb, the generation all died. And so we got to ask ourselves, Lord, and this is the prayer of Jesus in John 17. Father, may they be one as you and I are one. Many call this the unanswered prayer of Jesus. And the difference between this is, is this. When you're not one, though you're together, just being together, you can achieve great things. You can accomplish much. Right? I mean, you look at all the greatest companies that achieve great things. Even what made the first Neil Armstrong to land on the moon, what made it possible to, to build a plane, to build the shuttle, the, the rocket, to build computers, everything we see today. It was a team of people working together, but they were not one relationally. But they're focused on the task. So is it possible to achieve great things because you're together, but doesn't mean you're relationally healthy. And so in the body of Christ, it's possible to build a big ministry like a big corporation simply based on your gifts and your talents and your abilities. But if you're not one relationally with those you're working with in the body of Christ, you can be successful but not healthy. You can achieve much but without help. And so what's the difference then? This is why Jesus said, look, I'm standing outside. I want my house to become one with my presence at the center. He's the door. He said, if any man hear my voice, let him open the door. I've got to be the center of your work. And so the question is, what is God doing? I believe, I believe this is the season, the festival of trumpets, where the God is waking up the church to hear His voice, to turn their hearts towards Him as sons and daughters. Because where does oneness begin? Where did, what was the first thing to change between the prodigal son? It was with his father. See, only when the elder brother would turn his heart to the father with the two brothers be one. So unity or oneness as sons and daughters is the foundation for unity as brothers and sisters. If some children love the parents and some children don't, the children can never be one. So the foundation of oneness as brothers and sisters begins as sons and daughters to the head, to the common authority.
So the prayer of Jesus, see, before the harvest can come in, and the Feast of Tabernacles talks about the final harvest, the great, the latter rain, God needs His church who are together to become one. He needs the families that make up His church to become one. Because the church cannot be one without the families inside becoming one. Without the, the couples of each family becoming one. We are together, but are we one? And that's the test of His presence. That's the test. We cannot be blinded by our achievements. That's why the elder brother was so self-righteous. He said, Father, how could you how could you throw a party for your prodigal son who wasted your inheritance and I'm working so hard, you don't give me a party. And so, if you're not one, what's the problem? What's the difference between those who are one and those who are not one? The difference is our identity. The identity of those who are one define themselves as sons and daughters of the good father. Those who are just together but not one define themselves as servants and workers. They define themselves by what they can do, by their accomplishments, but not by their relationship. They see God as a big boss, as the employer, as a judge, but not as a father. And so, those who are not one, many times the conflict among Christians is between two mindsets. The, the mindset of the lack of oneness began with Lucifer. He was in heaven, serving well, very anointed, excellent worship leader, but not one with the father. And so because he was not one with the father, he could not be one with Michael and Gabriel. You see, he breaks down this way first. When this way is one, this way becomes one. All those who are one up, come one this way. But when this way breaks, we cannot be one with those who are not one with the Father. And so, we need to ask ourselves, so Jesus asked this question before he gave Peter the keys, before he appointed his leader. He said, disciples, who do you say I am? That was really a question of identity. And you notice before Jesus started ministry, what happened at his baptism? When he came out of the waters, what did the Father say? The Father established his identity. This is my beloved... Son. Are you sure? Yes. Beloved what? Son. Not beloved servant? <laughs> Not beloved slave? <laughs> Not beloved worker? No. But son. Jesus, did, Jesus was the greatest server but he did not serve as a servant, he served as a son. That's why he would be so patient for 30 years. If he was not a son, he'd get very impatient. He'd say, Father, I'm already 18 years old. Get me out of the house. Why is submit to the imperfect people, Joseph and Mary? I created them in sin. We are, we are perfect. I'm qualified to leave house and do miracles. He could have got very impatient at the age of 21. Now 21, I get the keys, Father. Let me out to heal the sick, raise the dead. Do all that you sent me. But no. How was, what was the key to his patience? It was a son. Only sons can wait. Servants get very impatient. And when they get impatient, they get angry with the boss. So Jesus, as a son, was willing to wait. He wasn't just sleeping all day. He was serving. For 30 years, he was serving in the house. As a son, as the eldest brother. Serving imperfect leaders. Serving imperfect brothers and sisters who didn't believe him. He was very faithful in the little things, faithful in, in, in what was his parents. He was the faithful as a son. And so, when, Pete, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? I don't know how many of them remembered what the father said when he was baptized, how many were there. But the right answer which Peter gave was, you are Christ, the son of the living God. See, the problem is today, many are, don't have the, the identity as sons because they see Jesus as a servant. And so, what happens when you have a bunch of servants working together in the same house? They can never be one. They're together but not one. And so, when Peter said, you are Christ the Son, what did Jesus say? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And when did the Father reveal this? At his baptism. But then again, when Jesus asked the question, so why was this question so important? You know the name Simon Peter? Simon comes from the Hebrew name Shimeon, which means to hear. And Peter means rock. You see, the foundation of our walk with God is the ability to hear His voice. And the, the weakest link in all our Bible colleges and seminaries, I should say all, the majority of them is students are not taught how to be led by the Spirit. They replace His voice with head knowledge. And the best example is this. If you are a child living overseas before internet, how do you correspond? You write air letters, aerogram. Right, three, four, I don't know how many remember that. Long blue letter, you pull three times, nine, ten, there, all there. You write, and then you collect them. 
And when you get homesick, you open your letters from your parents, you read the letter, all the good advice. Now again, guess what happens when you come home? Can you imagine, you come home, you're with your parents, and you never talk to them, but you read their letters every day. You memorize the letter, you study their letters, you know what the context of each word is, but you don't know their voice. Too many Christians have done this with the word. See, the word is available before you are saved. You can buy it in the bookshop. But when you get saved, the spirit of the living God is in you. You cannot put, make that the foundation. It's his voice that you got to know. Seven times in Revelation, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Not he that has brains to study, let him study. Or he that has eyes to read, let him read. He that has ears to hear, because this was not from eternity. The printed word only came much later. How did Abraham walk with God? How did Enoch walk with God before the printed Bible? And the biggest mistake is today is we have replaced relationship with the living word with head knowledge of the written word. We know all the letter but we don't know the spirit. Why? Because that comes from my identity of servants who are not sons. You see, when the servant works in your house, they don't know the father's voice. They only know how to do their job. But they don't know the heart of the father. And so Jesus asked this question, Simon Peter means ear and rock. But we want to walk in spiritual health, you want to walk with God and be blessed, we need to have ears to hear His voice. And I believe many of you are hearing, but you don't know you are hearing His voice. God is speaking. God is speaking, but you must be aware that it's His voice. And there's three voices. God's voice, the voice of the flesh, and the voice of the devil. And I think Dad used to say this. When it comes to the, the devil's voice, a lot of fear. When it comes to your voice, you love it very much. Very easy to do. Very easy to be. When God speaks, there is peace. There may be a bit of fear, but there is peace though may not be easy what He wants you to do. But God wants you to recognize His voice. So the foundation is He has to hear His voice. Jesus said to the devil, and the devil said, Make these stones into bread. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every letter written in the Old Testament. Every word. Is that? But by all that is written by the law of the prophets? No, no, no. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Proceeds from right, not the scrolls that were written, but from the mouth of the living God. And Jesus told this to the religious leaders. He said, "Look, you study the scriptures diligently, but you don't come to me for life. We will never replace relationship with the living word with the written word. But on the foundation of relationship, we study the word. So every time you open the Bible, the Holy Spirit speak to me. Give me ears to hear through this. This is the medium He speaks, so that you know." We are hearing is correct. This is the checks and balances of what you are hearing. Amen. So Peter heard that Christ was a son. Now why is this important? Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you by my Father in heaven. Not only is hearing the foundation, but what's the foundation revelation we must all hear? What's the first revelation we must all hear? The same revelation that Peter had. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a servant or is he a son to you? If Jesus is a servant to you, if Peter said, Hey Jesus, you are the greatest servant, now surely you are Christ the servant of the living God. Then what happens? We will see God as the boss that the servant works for. And if you see God as a boss and not as a father, then you will define yourself as a servant. And how many of you know that servants can never be one? You can work together as servants, but you never can be one as sons and daughters. So this was so important. So when Peter had the revelation, Jesus said, you are qualified to get the keys. Peter, here are the keys of the kingdom. And so the question is, God's heart for each one of you is that those who are believers in your house, you will not just be together with them, but be one with them. Right? And those who are not, what about pastor, those who are not saved, maybe your spouse is not saved, or your daughter, or your son, or father, mother, they're not saved. Your light cannot shine in them if you're not one. They will never come to the kingdom unless you know that you are a son and daughter. So God's heart for his house is, yes, he's called them all out. There are three tribes here, three tribes there, so many denominations, so many groups. But we must come together to Christ the door and the tabernacle of his presence. And how do we come together? We need a revelation of Christ is a son, God is a father. Because Jesus said, he came to not just heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, make disciples. Jesus came as a son to reveal the Father. He told Philip, you see me, you see the Father. Because the sons and daughters 
are representatives of the Father. They are ambassadors of the Father. So that those who are fatherless will see the Father through their children. Because a tree is known by its fruit. And, uh, and, and it's so wonderful to, to, to hear the name that our brother gave his ministry, rescuing these traffic girls so that they can be rescued and become daughters who become mothers. This relationship, they're not rescuing servants to make them servants or maids or workers. The foundation is relationship. And if we are just together, we can do great things, we can build great churches, great ministries. But if you're not one, you become very successful but not healthy. And here's the danger of success. The danger of success is it can blind you to your spiritual lack of health. That's what happened to the elder brother. Why did the elder brother come to his senses? Because he was so successful. No problem. The younger prodigal only came to his senses when he lost everything. And so sometimes God allows challenges. He allows crisis to open our spiritual eyes. He say, hey, in this time of crisis, I want to heal you as my son. I want to reveal myself to you as your father. I'm not your boss. You're not my servant. Yes, I want you to serve, but not to serve as a servant, but to serve as a son and daughter. And so we need to have this identity. Now, how do we get this identity? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I only realize today that this is what Shine Jesus Shine is based on. You may have been singing that song for so long and I never connected it to the scripture well because I just was teaching on this on Friday and so when the song came to mind this morning I said, Marcus, I think we need to change the opening song to, to this song. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 It says, well, let's, let's go up to verse 17 3 17 says Now the Lord is the Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is there is Freedom. You know, John says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So, where the Spirit of the Lord is, when the presence of the Lordship of Christ is, there is liberty. Liberty for what? Freedom for what? Verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom to transform, freedom to change from what to what? To change from serving as servants to serving as sons and daughters. To change, to be transformed from serving as fatherless workers and servants to sons and daughters who know God as their father. So how does this transformation happen? We all will unveil a male face because Jesus is in us. So when we behold as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, what does it mean in the mirror? It says when you behold as in the mirror the glory. How do you behold the glory? The glory speaks of God's goodness. Many of our songs this morning is God you are so good. Okay, so when you think about his goodness and his kindness to you, you are being changed, transformed into his image. What is his image? Christ the Son, not Christ the servant. Now guess what happens if two people are seeking his face, they're coming more like him, how will it impact their relationship to each other? The closer we become to him as sons and daughters, the closer we become to each other as brothers and sisters. So the key to oneness is having a common focus, seeking God's face. What does it mean? What does it mean as a mirror? So when you become like him, what, what are you seeing? You are seeing the glory of you in him. This is glory shining in you. When the Lord looks at your face, you see a bit of him in you. You are seeing each other because you are becoming like each other. Like a mirror. When two people are like each other, they see each other in themselves. So, how do we behold His glory? 2 Chronicles 7 says, If my people humble themselves, pray and seek my face for this very reason, so that we can be transformed to His image as a son. We seek His face and turn from their wicked ways that have kept them apart. The wicked ways of having the mindset of a servant and a worker. The wicked ways of not knowing the identity of sons and daughters. If we turn away from those wicked ways and walk in the ways of Christ, He will hear from heaven. He will forgive us sin and heal our land. So for us to be, become one with each other, we first have to know God as our Father. We have to become one with Him as sons and daughters. Because here's the thing, when we know Christ as a son, we, be, we are transformed to His image as sons and daughters. And guess what happens? When you become a son and daughter relationally, 
He revealed the Father. Because you know, when God made Adam and Eve, it says male and female in his image. There is an image of the Father in both the woman and the man. Together, man and wife reveal the Father. Son and daughters together reveal the Father. That's why when the husband and wife come together, there is a bit of both in their children. Maybe one child may have more of the dad and more of the mom, but we have each child has both of father and mother. So that's why the two shall become one in revealing the father to man. So how do we do this? We need to humble ourselves in my people called by my name. In other words, all those who are together in my church, in my house, all those who are together in the family. Humble yourselves and pray. If you don't humble yourselves, you will not pray. Right? So it requires humility to pray. Prayer simply reveals our dependence upon the Lord. A proud person will not pray because he doesn't need God, or he thinks he doesn't need God. So we need to humble ourselves to pray, but here's the greater area of humility. To pray as faith seekers. Now here's this, why is it so important to, to what does it mean to pray as faith seekers? To pray based on what God has done for you. To pray based on His goodness in your life. To pray based on His testimonies for you. To pray based on His promises. Because if you don't pray based on the goodness of God, guess what you'll pray from? You'll be distracted by all the darkness around you. You'll be, you'll be coming to God based on the praise He has not answered, what God has not done for you, what He's not doing, all your problems. You end up praying in unbelief and stress and anxiety and fear. So if you want to pray with faith, you've got to come before God based on what He's done for you. What he's promised you. And as you say, and that gives you the spirit of faith. And that's why we often begin by praising God, worshipping him, and then we pray. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. That means come before him based on what he's done, his goodness. That's the glory. We're seeking his face, the goodness of God. Now what happens? In verse, if you look at chapter 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, we are shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So the knowledge of the Father's goodness is seen in the face of Christ, verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of God's power will be of God and not of us. All of us have God's treasure in our human vessels. What does earthen vessels speak of? It means we are made of Dust, dust, dust. Okay, we are not perfect people. We all have areas of weakness. We all fail and fall many times. We're not perfect, but God's treasure is in each one of us. Now here's the challenge. How many of you know where gold is found? Is gold sparkling and shining on top of the ground? Here I am, just picking up. Where is gold found? Beneath the dirt. And as long as you're affected with the dirt, you'll never find the gold. You're distracted by the dirt, you'll never find the gold hidden underneath. And that's the same thing. If you're not seeking God's face, you'll be distracted by what He's not doing for you. You may even get offended with God. God, I serve you so much. This is the servant talking. God, I do so much for you in church. I do so much for you in the marketplace. Why are all my prayers answered? Why did this bad thing happen? You see, the servant mindset expects God to reward them for their works. But the son and daughter knows they are blessed because of the relationship. So a servant mindset is highly, is easily offended, very sensitive. That's for reward. When people don't acknowledge and give thanksgiving, they get offended. I'm not appreciated. I do so much, I'm not appreciated. But the son and daughter, that's because they are already loved. And they do it out of love for the family. And so, if we are not seeking His face, there are too many Christians who are angry with God. God, I'm so good, why did you let this bad thing happen? How many times have you heard that question? Why did God let bad things happen to good people? You know what's wrong with that question? Because that question assumes that good things happen to you because you're so good. How come nobody asks God, am I that good? All these good things happen? Wow, I'm amazed how good I am. All the good things happen. No, no, no. If you know you're blessed not because of your goodness, why do you think bad things happen? Because He's bad. God blesses you because He's good, not because you're good. He blesses you because of His grace, not your, you deserving it. So when we seek God's face, humble us out, pray. So every time when I come to the Lord, when we come before the Lord, and you're at home, say, Lord Jesus, 
I want your face to shine on me. That's what the benediction is. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. In fact, Isaiah 60 says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, for the glory of God has risen upon you. Who's the you? Is it everybody? Only those whose face are directed at his. His face will only shine when your face is directed at his. God will only arise and shine upon those who seek his face. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of God will shine upon the faces of those who are seeking his face. To shine in the darkness. Right? Because when the Lord's face shine upon you and the glory is upon you, what happens when you face the darkness? Now you see darkness with hope. Now you see darkness with faith. Now like Joshua and Caleb, when you see the giants, the light of God's glory on you, see the giant as grasshoppers compared to God's size. David saw Goliath as a grasshopper compared to the size of God. But when you don't seek his face and you're distracted by what is wrong, when you see the giant, you see yourself as a grasshopper. So how many of you prefer to see yourself as a grasshopper or to see the giant as a grasshopper compared to God? How you see depends on where you're focused on. And so when we, remember this, we're all treasures, we're all, God has put his treasure in us. So guess what? When you get to know people well enough, the most anointed servants, sons of God, no matter how powerfully you use servants of God, when you get to fellowship with them, and maybe if they live in your house for a couple of days, guess what will happen? You suddenly discover, hey, they're not all that perfect. Like. Ah, I sense an insecurity in their life. I sense that they're, they're suffering from rejection. Oh, but, wow, they're winning, winning millions. Yes, of course. God is not using them because they're perfect. The many times we assume the more God uses us, the bigger us, the more perfect we are. No. No matter how powerful God uses us, the treasure is under the dirt. Because you're always a work in progress. So the, the thing is sometimes we elevate men and women of God because we don't really know them. You want to know somebody, ask their spouse and children. And you'll discover that you have the good, the bad and the ugly in everybody. But despite the bad and the ugly, because of God's treasure in it, He can still use us nicely. So never think you're not good enough for God to use you. He doesn't want to use you because you're perfect or because you're His child. Because His treasure is inside you. And only when we can seek His face and we're no longer distracted by the problems and His face shines upon us, now guess what happens? It will change the way we see one another. It begins upward. When we seek His face, we begin to know God's love for us as our Father. We know how much He loves us as His children. And now when we look at one another, we will no longer be distracted by the earthen vessel. You'll be no longer seeing people as, why are you that kind of person? Huh? How God uses you amazes me. <laughs> How can God use this kind of fellow? Mm -hmm. When you see God's face, you see His treasure in each one, and know that God uses us, not because you're perfect, but so that, what's the reason? 1 Corinthians 4, 7, so that He will get all the glory. You know what? Because if He uses us because we're perfect, we become proud. You know why I'm used by God? Because I'm so good. Because I pray six hours a day. I fast 35 days every month. <laughs> I pray and fast 25 hours a day. And so we think that we are anointed and used because of all that we do. That's the servant mindset. See, the gifts and the calling are without character. All God is looking for is faith. And that's why many will stand before the Lord one day on the gifts and calling and expect to be known. Say, so, Lord, I did many miracles in your name. I cast out demons in your name. And he will say, if he spoke my name, you say, Pa? And you don't know, you didn't see all the miracles I did. Who are you? Jesus probably say, Paul I know, my son I know, but who are you? Go. And the servant mindset expects to be recognized by God because of what they do. But the kingdom of God is not made up of an orphanage, or a factory, or a home for workers and servants. It's a family, led by a father, who has sons and daughters. Heaven is called a family. You know why? Because it's led by a father. Family is father's house. And when we get saved, we receive the spirit of adoption. To be called sons and daughters, free from fear. Free from fear. So this season, I believe God is doing a, a, a shaking up. People are going to hear that sound in their ears, like Peter got a revelation. Hey, Christ is the son. God is my father. I am blessed because I'm his child, not because of what I can do for him. And, no, and now when you see the darkness and you see the problems and the challenges, no longer do you lose your faith. You see the darkness with His glory upon your face. Because now you are seeking His faith. In other words, everything you do is in response to God's goodness. And that is how Jesus could sleep in the storm. 
His, he did not lose his peace because the boat was rocking. He could sleep in peace because he was sleeping in God's presence. And from the place of peace, he could speak to the storm and say, Be still. So no matter how bad the world looks like around us, no matter how dark it is, though we don't know when a vaccine will come out, how long it takes, how long is it MCO, who knows? But guess what? Your peace is not based on that. Your joy is not based on that. Let the light of God's glory upon you shine in the uncertainty of the future. Shine in the uncertainty of your challenges. And so when you begin to see darkness with light, you begin to see one another with His light. So what God is beginning to do from now, and this is really the message of this house, becoming one. Couples, families becoming one. Families of families, local churches becoming one. We have lots of people together, in different ministries, in different homes, in different churches, but very few are really one. And that is why division keeps happening. That is why there is no life. There is great achievement, but no presence of God. No peace. No joy. People are serving frustrated with each other, provoked by one another, competitive, insecure, intimidated, strife, jealousy, unforgiveness, successful but not healthy. Don't build your muscle and neglect your internal health. You see, your, your, your body, your muscles can only do so much provided your organs inside, which are hidden, are healthy. And those internal organs is your relational health as sons and daughters to God and as one another, brothers and sisters. So we're going to take communion. This is basically my message. I'm going to go into how this fits in with Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. He's the door. He's the way to the presence of God. He's the truth that sets us free to transform. He's the life that is the light of God's glory. The goodness, the glory of the Father upon us. And so your prayer, my prayer is, Father, I thank you for those who are together in this house. I thank you for those in my family. Father, my prayer is that those who are together will also become one. Because how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Not when servants dwell together, cannot. Workers can never dwell in unity, but only brothers can. Who are first one as sons and daughters. For there the Lord commands the blessing of life. That life is the glory of God. That life is the presence of the tabernacle through Jesus the door. And so as the church becomes together as one, and I believe this is why God has allowed the MCO. You know why? He's bringing families together from far, working all over the world. Many times parents are divided for employment. But now many have to come together because of the job situation. And so God is forcing extended time with family members to make those who are together one relationally. And to become one, we've got to see the treasure in them. Not be distracted by how they upset us, how they offended us, how they let us down, but see how God has used them to be a blessing to us. We've got to define them by the treasure and not define them by the flesh. We've got to see God as the goodness to us and not God as why you let this thing happen to me. So first it begins, how do we see God? Do we see Him as the Father who has blessed us so much? I mean, we can see Him as the Father who has blessed us and not as... I mean, can you imagine? Jesus, how did you let your own cousin John the Baptist be beheaded? Your own relative, he prepared the way for you, he baptized you and you let him be arrested and, and be, have his head chopped off? Doesn't make sense. But you know one of the last things Jesus told him to his disciples? Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And so, how is the church going to become one? The church is together, every church is together. We come together. But you know what? It took 10 days for the 120 to be one. Because I don't know how well the 120 knew each other before Pentecost. So they probably came in as strangers. Yes, we had the family of Jesus, we had the 12, we had the disciples, the apostles. But many of them didn't know each other. But I think 24 7 for 10 days they finally became one. And before the spirit came out, it said they were in one place and one accord. So God wants to do this in your house. God wants to do this with your spouse, with your children. So that His light upon you can shine in those who are your relatives but not safe. See, this is the key to evangelism. That's why we are called the light. We cannot be the light in the darkness if His face is not shining upon us. We owe it to our unsaved family members to be face seekers. So that you will not be react or offended by their darkness. Or you see them with the light of hope 
like as faith seekers. When we are together as one and God's goodness shines upon us, those who do not know the Lord will be impacted. And many of us are together with relatives who are not saved. Or maybe with relatives who may be saved but they are not really united, they are not one with us. They could be in your house, they could be in your city. And so it's so important, the world needs us to be faith seekers so that His glory will shine upon you and me. So that we will not only become be together as servants, but together as sons and daughters. I know the Father's service. Is love being given up? You can, you can hand out the bread and the cup. Thank you. came from the north, south, east and west. We have come together this day under this roof. But let the sound awaken us so that you can become one with those who are his in your house and those who are not his. God's light upon you will shine in your lives. And you become like the light in your darkness, the salt to make them thirsty for the living water. So that your family, so that this house will become one. Let's stand together.